good day. I hope you are having a good day, that uh, we are all sheltered in place. We're all staying at home, except for those of us that are working in essential businesses. And I know that some of you are, um, and I urge you please to stay safe, be cautious, that uh, wearing masks, washing our hands, it's the right thing to do right now. And the social distancing rule of being within no closer than six feet of anybody nearby has disrupted our lives. It has taken us away from the classroom that my colleagues at Columbus State University, we miss our students. And I mean all my colleagues, the administration, the staff, the faculty, uh, my friends in the English department, we all talk about how we would like for life to be back to normal. We miss seeing you in the hallways. We miss seeing you in our offices. We miss seeing you in our classrooms. That while we've been able to carry on online, uh, we know that our interactions with you are, are not quite the same, that it's not quite the same as seeing you in class. We hope to get back to doing that as soon as possible. Today, I've got a poem for you by the second poet laureate of the United States, and that is a man named Richard Wilbur. He twice won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. He was born in 1921, which makes him a member of what uh, we know, we call Tom Brokaw, it's called the greatest generation, that Wilbur served um, in active duty during World War II, as did so many other members of his generation. It was once he served in World War II when he returned that he began writing poetry in earnest, and he describes it this way. He said, quote, one does not use poetry for its major purposes as a means to organize oneself in the world until one's world somehow gets out of hand." Unquote. I felt that that was a pertinent quote for us because as of late, our world has gotten out of hand. Wilbur's response to his world getting out of hand was to write poetry. He writes optimistic verse as opposed to pessimistic verse, and he tries to order his world in such a way as to use words to make things better, or to make things seem better, which in fact makes things better, if that makes any sense. The poem I have chosen today is called A Barred Owl. Now, I was reminded of this poem just a few days back because in my neighborhood near Lake Bottom Park, we have many predator birds, that there are hawks that live in the park, there are several varieties of owls, but the grandest of them all is the barred owl. And I know that few of you have ever seen one, that their wingspans are about 40 inches. They are huge birds that uh, you imagine what your image of, a, of an owl was, and the barred owl is him or her. They have a very distinctive call that I in my childhood, I heard barred owls when I lived in an old farmhouse with my grandmother and my mom and dad and my aunt in the hills of North Carolina. To me, they were mysterious creatures because I didn't see the owls. I only heard them. I heard them at night. They had very distinctive call. We called them hoot owls in North Carolina that, of course, they are barred owls. Here's Wilbur's poem, and it speaks to how Words can make a situation less frightening. Words can make a situation more frightening, and he points that out, but they can be used to make a situation less frightening. And uh, I was first drawn to this poem because I studied the 18th century for like 40 years. Anybody that writes in heroic couplets is going to raise my interest because, of course, that was the gold standard for the po poets that I studied, Pope, Dryden, and even Samuel Johnson. So uh, I was intrigued that our second poet laureate was choosing to use poet, the heroic couplets in this poem. I won't explicate it any further. A Barred Owl by Richard Wilbur. The warping night air having brought the boom of an owl's voice into her darkened room, we tell the wakened child that all she heard was an odd question from a forest bird, asking of us, if rightly listened to, who cooks for you? 
And then, who cooks for you? Words which can make our terrors bravely clear can also thus domesticate a fear and send a small child back to sleep at night, not listening for the sound of stealthy flight or dreaming of some small thing in a claw borne up to some dark branch and eaten raw. Y'all stay safe out there.